We are in uh, Psalm 37, if you would like to turn there. It's 40 verses. It's a long psalm. Uh, it's a great psalm uh, because of the content of the psalm is, is how do you live as a Christian in turbulent times? Uh, and we live in turbulent times in many ways. Um, before we look at uh, our, the second uh, study of this great psalm and what David has to say about how to live in t- turbulent times, I want to introduce you to uh, some of the words of, uh, of, uh, of Paul uh, as he writes in the New Testament. Here's what he says. It says, now brethren, uh, in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, now brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be s- soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or, or by word or by letter, as if from us, as if the day of Christ had come. Uh, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, his second coming, will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Uh, He is the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul says, uh, as you think about what lies in the future, uh, he speaks uh, a prophetic word here and says, before the day of the Lord comes, the second coming of Christ, which uh, from what the Lord tells us happens at the end of the seven-year tribulations. He, Paul says, you can expect uh, these things to happen in this order. He says there's going to be a falling away. He calls it the falling away. And when you put an article before a word like that, there's certain classifications of the article in Greek. Uh, I would classify it grammatically as the monadic use of the article, meaning it is the one and only. It's like the son. It's the only son that's in our domain. So when you say it is the falling away, it's not just a kind of a general falling away. No, this is like a falling away that's never been seen in humankind before. The falling away. The word falling away, apostasia, uh, is the word apostasy, apostasia. Uh, lexically, it means a renunciation uh, of previous loyalty or absolute rebellion. Sound familiar? Um, it also means, lexically, defiance uh, of the established system of authority. That's what apostasia, apostasy, means. So Paul says, before the Lord returns, you can expect the apostasy, the falling away, the rebellion against what? Everything that should be held tightly to, men will rebel against. We could go down the list. They will fall away from spiritual truth, embracing false truths. They will fall away from true science for false science. They will abandon logical reasoning. Have you encountered this yet? You try to use logic and reasoning and rhetoric has replaced that, yelling, screaming. Uh, They will uh, abandon true sexuality. They will abandon morals. They will abandon decency. They will abandon respect for each other. They will abandon history. Deconstructionism is. This is what history said, and this is what happened, but we're going to deconstruct it to rewrite it to make it say what we want it to say based on our ideology. This is apostasia, rebellion. They will uh, abandon the traditional family. They'll They'll totally abandon their respect for the unborn. They'll abandon law and order. Paul says, you can expect before the Lord returns, because they were telling people in Thessalonica that the Lord had already returned. Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you. The apostasia, the falling away has not yet come. But when you see it, it's going to be abandonment of everything that you would hold true to. Then he goes on to say in verse 7, I'll get to Psalm 37 in a minute. You still with me? Thank you. uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, Paul says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Because he said, apostasia, falling away, will first occur, and then comes the man of sin, the Antichrist. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then, notice the cause effect, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with power, signs, and lying wonders. He says there's going to be a falling away that's never happened on the planet before. And Paul says, in my day and time, you can already see the lawlessness. So this has been 2,000 years. Lawlessness has increased. And, and Paul says, eventually, this lawlessness is going to terminate when the one who restrains is taken out of the way. This is an entire sermon in and of itself. So I won't get into all the Greek exegetical work you need to do to identify who the restrainer is. But the fact that the restrainer is, is, is called he, that personal pronoun, this, this, in my estimation, based on the grammar, is the Holy Spirit. 
He restrains evil. Where is the Holy Spirit today? I mean, I know he's omnipresent, but where is he specifically? He's in the church of Jesus Christ. He's in us. See, we're the, we're, we are what holds evil and lawlessness at bay. But what, what does lawlessness want to do? Get rid of the church. Wipe out Judeo-Christianity. And that's, that's their intention. And Paul says, anticipate this happening, that there will be uh, the coming of the evil one, and he will be all about taking away that which represents Christ. And he will be come to power when the Spirit of God steps off to the side. This is why I believe in the rapture of Christ. He comes and he takes the church. He's still on the present and still here, but he's not here in the form of the church anymore. He, he then pulls us out. He goes back to deal with Israel to finish Daniel's 70th prophet, prophetic week. And, and at that point is when the man of lawlessness appears. What are we seeing today in our world? The advancement of lawlessness at breakneck speed. I mean, it's shocking. It is shocking. Uh, do I even need to go through um, uh, stuff that's happened this week to validate lawlessness? No, not really. I mean, there is not a day. I don't, I don't look at the news, read the news, and I'm absolutely shocked at the pervasive level of lawlessness. Uh, it's all through the culture. See, David, David dealt with this in his day and time. It's just at a whole new level uh, in, in, in the times of the end as we are approaching. The question is, as days become more lawless, what's our response as a Christian? How should we be behave? How should we live? This is what David writes about in Psalm 37. That's why we're going to spend three weeks studying it, because he equips us for lawless living. So his premise is, how are we supposed to live in tumultuous, testy times? So we'll review. He gave us two words of advice as a king and as a military man and as a Christian. Number one in verses one to two, he says, I have a long and short view of life. The long view is you're going to, God is coming back and he's going to establish his kingdom of righteousness. But in the meantime, he says, don't get all uptight about that which is temporary. The word he uses here is don't get angry. Don't get upset, like explosively so, verses 1 to 2. Uh, then he says in verses 3 to 7, uh, the long view and, and short view of life is, again, the long view is the king is coming. The short view is, what do I do in the meantime? Uh, he says, in the meantime, live, live sold out to God. What does our culture need? Christians who totally follow hard after Christ. That there is no doubt that you love Christ, you can represent Christ, uh, and everything about your life exudes the love of Christ to those about you. You sold out to God? Is it, is it, they convict you based on the evidence of your life you're sold out to God? But he's going to move on from that in verses 7 um, to verse 20 uh, to give us a third concept of how to live in tumultuous times. Uh, here he's going to say, don't be undone by the winds of the wicked. Why? Well, because the great reversal is coming. What great reversal? Well, where the first shall be last and the last shall be first, as Jesus said, that when Jesus appears, it's the great reversal. It's coming. So he says, in the meantime, don't be undone by the winds of the wicked. Do you ever get tired by the winds of the wicked? I do. It's like sometimes I think they're like unstoppable. They take over school boards. They take over universities. I've watched it all of my life. Uh, they, they're pervasive. They bring in their ideology and they bring that into the culture, and it permeates like, uh, like a cancer, uh, that life around them. They, they are pervasive. Uh, if they want to cancel you in our culture, they can cancel you. If they don't like what you say as a Christian, uh, they take you off of Twitter, Facebook, Vimeo, whatever. It's happened to me. What do you do when they seem to be unstoppable? How should you react? Uh, so he's going to tell you how to react in these verses. And what he's going to tell you is, keep in mind at all times that what is, like now, is not what will be. What is is not what will be. We tend to look so much at what is, forget about what will be when Christ returns, and we get depressed and angry in the present. He says, don't do that. David's going to give us some advice. So let's dive into what he says. Verse 7b, the second part of the verse. He says, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Uh, he's already used this uh, concept of do not fret back up in the first verse. He's going to use it again in verse 8, and he's telling you the word for fret in Hebrew means don't get explosively angry when the wicked advance, when their schemes seem to, they seem to get away with it. Haven't you ever seen schemes that have been hatched and unfolded and the evidence is presented, and then nothing happens to the people who committed the schemes? And you think to yourself, when do they get caught? No matter what the scheme is. 
David says, well, don't get all worked up to the point where you are like seething in anger. This doesn't mean that a Christian should not be upset about that which is immoral around him. No, no, I should be disturbed and bothered by the advancement of evil, but not to a point where, uh, you, if you read my, if I had a Twitter account, that, that it was just venom, it was anger, or my Facebook account, I don't have one, but if you saw my Facebook account, it's full of anger and animosity, and they, that's not what the world needs from a Christian. David says, don't, don't get all worked up. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way. Uh, what should a Christian be? Proverbs 51 tells us uh, that a gentle answer does what? Turns away wrath. What do you typically hear? Well, not a gentle answer. Oh, you're going to say that? I'm going to say that. You're going to say this? I'm going to say that. Um, unbelievable. Uh, when Trump was first voted in as president, and I went to San Diego to help take care of Liz's mom as she was dying. Uh, I had a very liberal family member come down and join us uh, uh, for uh, dinner one night. Uh, and this was right after the president became the president. And this, my family member had worked with Michelle Obama on different things. Uh, she flew out here for things for the state of California. And so, you know, I know where she's coming from. And so we were sitting at the dinner table and I didn't even say anything with all the grandchildren there. And she launched into me yelling, screaming, cursing. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I had to finally look at my sister-in-law and say, can we go outside? I, th I think we need to go outside. And so we went outside in the driveway and I said, I'm your brother-in-law. I've been your brother-in-law for 40 years. Why are you yelling at me? I didn't, I didn't even say anything to provoke anything. She's so angry, so angry. I mean, how do you deal with situations like that? Do you return anger for anger? Argument for argument? Uh, no, soft answer, slow to, an slow, to, slow to anger, gentle answer. This is what the scriptures teach us. This is what we learn from Jesus. Um, he says, uh, David says, when you think about how to deal with the wicked, don't, don't, get, uh, don't get all upset when they prosper. Uh, and because of the man who carries out his wicked schemes, whatever those schemes may be. Um, you can read through the Old Testament about characters like Jezebel, positive or negative character. This site says negative, what say you? totally negative. What did she say? Her husband likes Naboth's vineyard. I really like his vineyard. It's lush. It's beautiful. I want that, but I can't get it because Naboth has it. He's a righteous man. What does Jezebel say to her husband? No problem. You're the king. We'll work it out. We'll get him eliminated, and you can then just seize it. I mean, uh, it, make it yours. Uh, talk about a scheme. Um, Eli, the high priest of Israel, had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Uh, and in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22, they, they would take advantage of women waiting in line to get into the tabernacle. They were priests, and they got away with it. I mean, so you could go back in biblical history and understand that people have got away with schemes. Eventually, God dealt with them, but uh, the schemes were just pervasive. And what's David say? Don't get all worked up. Don't get all worked up. He says in verse 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Now, this is a different word for anger. You know, there's different kinds of anger, correct? There's, there's a kind, not that anybody ever gets angry here, correct? There's different kinds of words for anger. So this, there's like a, the coal mine fire kind of anger. It's always burning under the ground. You're walking around this person like eggshells because you never know what's going to trip them. And then all of a sudden, the fire comes out and scorches the ground of your family, right? Then there's just the kind of person, they're just angry all the time. See, this word for anger here, af, means to have a red nose. Did you hear me? I know it's early. I know this is Hebrew. Af means to have a red nose. When you are angry, it's kind of like that which tells you, oh, dad, he's off the hook. Look at his nose. Because when the nose starts glowing red, what's that saying? Yeah, you're pretty mad. You're, you're about to, to blow your top. So he says, cease from having that kind of anger about you. And then he says, forsake wrath, wrath, another word for anger. This word uh, in Hebrew, it's the word kama. It, it means, uh, it literally denotes the venom of like a snake. And when you're so angry at somebody and you're going to plant your teeth into them like a snake would to somebody and you're gonna bite into them and release the venom of your words, he says, you gotta stop doing that. Now, don't you find it interesting? He's speaking to this regarding Christians. A Christian would never do those kinds of things, huh? Oh, yeah, you would. Yeah, he says, don't, don't live like that. He says, if you live like that, he says, do, do not fret. 
uh, fors forsake wrath. And then he says, do not fret again. He's told us now t two times there, uh, or three times now. He says, do not fret, because fretting leads to what? Evil doing. Evil doing. How so? Well, if you can't control your temper, the probability of you doing something that you're going to regret is great, either physical or verbal. Ever been there? I've been there. I have a friend uh, uh, out in California uh, I grew up with, played sports with, uh, very, very muscular, very strong guy. I always feared him, still do. Um, he's just built. Uh, and one day he was driving on the, he's a Christian man, he's got a family, uh, he's been in, uh, you know, in leadership at his church and everything, but he's on the LA freeway, like, which can totally test your faith. <laughs> Cars to infinity. And there was one car that kept pulling in front of him and then slowing down. Don't you hate that? Then, then he would pull around and he'd pull in front of the guy and then that guy'd pull in front of him and then he'd slow down again. This went on for like miles. This is testing the faith of my friend. So I asked my friend like, okay, so what did you do? He said, it was really ticking me off. I was getting really mad. What, what did David say in, in evil times? Isn't a person slowing down all the time evil? Okay, are, are you the person that's slowing down? So he, you know, so he, he I said, what did you do? He said, I, I don't know, I just kind of had it with that guy. So I pulled up alongside of him and I it's rolled down the window. I'm like, hey, you, pull over. Never pull over. Bad things happen when you pull over, correct? So that guy pulls over. My friend pulls over. That guy gets out of his car. My friend gets out of his car. My friend meets this guy uh, as he's getting out of his car and the guy failed to realize how large my friend was, uh, and he said something, well, like you shouldn't say. Well, that was kind of like the final straw for my friend. So I said, well, when he said that, what'd you do? He goes, I just laid him out on the hood. One punch. He went flying, sprawled out on the hood, knocked out. What'd you do? Well, I got back in my car, and I got back in traffic. Okay, I have a question for you. Is, is this the Christian thing to do? You're thinking, oh yeah, no, no. What did David say? Get real. Are you with me today? Yeah, you might feel like getting out of the car. You might feel like having a conversation. You don't do it because he says, if you have anger like this, it can lead to evil doing. I mean, if I were to do that, if I ever did that, I'm sure half the church would drive by on 495. There's Marty. <laughs> Whoa, I couldn't do it. So don't do it. It leads to evil doing. Verse 9, he gives you the reason why you shouldn't do it in more detail. So it leads to evil doing. Verse 9, uh, for evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they're going to inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. Whatever that wicked man is, whatever it is that he's doing, he will be no more. You will look for him, for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and delight themselves in the abundant prosperity. He says, keep, keep in mind uh, the way things are really going to play out. The evildoers, they're only here for a moment. The, the righteous are going to inherit the earth, not them. He says, you're going to look for his place and he will not be there. If, if you look at this in your Bible, the word there is not there. I mean, because the word there is italicized, which means it's not in the Hebrew text. He says the day is coming when you'll look for an evil person and they will not be. I mean, they won't even be around. How hard is it to find an evil person now? You gotta look far, just look across the room. I mean, there's, there's, you could, it's not hard to find an evil person. And so he said the day is coming when the evil people will not be there. Keep your mind on what is going to happen in the future, not what is in the present. So who inherits the earth when the king comes back, when Jesus? Will it be the mean-spirited? What say you? No, no. How about mockers? No. Uh, marauders? No. How about the menacing? No. You could go down the whole long list. They don't inherit the earth. Who inherits the earth? What's David say? Believers. The humble. The humble will inherit the land. I mean, those will be the ones who inherit the land. See, dominion and rulership that the world is fighting for, and we see it all too clearly in D.C. as they fight for power. No, dominion and power is eventually not given to the haughty and, and those kind of people. It's given to the humble. It's given to people who realize, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and the Savior Jesus is the solution. See, it's the humble who hunger after God. They're given the kingdom. What kingdom? This is a whole sermon series. This is going to be a long sermon. There's no break between this service and the next. I forgot to tell you. 
let's just recap like what's coming. Because we tend to forget because we're stuck in the here and now. So what is going to happen? Uh, well, Isaiah chapter 9 tells us. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and what? Well, the government is going to be on his shoulder. Who is this that's coming, and what government is this? Well, it's the Davidic empire of the Messiah. But what is his name? And his name shall be called? It's not Christmas yet, but we can talk about it. His name is? Too wonderful to even comprehend. Who is he? The ultimate wise counselor. Who's that? God, the mighty God. And who is he? Well, he's the one who has always been everlasting father. Oh, and by the way, he's Shalom. He's the prince of peace. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. He's coming. He's coming to do what? To create a kingdom of peace when there is no peace. See, can we vote in peace here in about a month? Maybe a little bit, but will it last? Eh, probably not. Are you a pessimist or an optimist? No, I'm a realist. Because I know that the peace of the kingdom is not coming until Jesus comes. See, the king is coming, and in the meantime, I'm not, I can be concerned about evil, address evil, etc., but I'm not supposed to act like the evil around me. How do they act? Anger, rhetoric. That's what they do. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2. What does it say about the king and his coming? It says in Isaiah chapter 2, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house, which is where the temple is built in Jerusalem, shall be established on the top of the mountains. Or he's going to elevate geographically, uh, topographically, uh, the Mount Zion where the temple is going to be for the Messiah. He's going to change that mountain to be the highest mountain on the planet. It shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will flow into it. You name the race that knows Jesus, they're going to be there. It says, many people will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He, this is the Messiah, will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he's going to judge between the nations, rebuke many people, and they will beat their, their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations, they're not going to fight anymore with each other. Why? Because the, the Messiah is on the throne. And, and we can travel there. I don't know if it's LL Airlines or how you're going to get there, but you'll be able to go there and walk up into the presence of Jesus and, he, and he, teach me the law, Lord, that the lawless have hated all these years. Teach me. And he will teach the nations and there will be peace. See, David says, consider that the meek are looking for the king coming who will establish peace. Daniel writes this in chapter 7. Speaks about the Antichrist. He, the Antichrist, will speak pompous words against who? God himself. He will persecute the saints of the Most High. He shall intend to change the times and the law. You already see this today in our day and age. How those who are godless are constantly trying to change things that have been around forever. This is all of the spirit of the Antichrist. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half a time. So he's going he's to persecute the, the believers for three and a half years. But that's not all that he says. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion of the Antichrist to consume and destroy it for how long? Forever. And then what happens? Well, um, then there's a kingdom. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given unto the people us, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom, the Messiah's kingdom, is an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions shall serve and obey him. When the king comes, there's peace. There's peace. He says, keep your eye on what's coming, not what is. You might be stuck in the weeds of what's now. He says, don't, no, don't, don't be overly concerned about this. I mean, address evil, but never take your eye on the fact that I'm coming back. Verse 12, what happens in the meantime? Verse 12, David says, well, the wicked, they plot against the righteous and they gnash at them with their teeth. Don't they? You just stand up for something righteous in our culture and you'll get the teeth gnashing thing. They can't stand you. They will hate you. He says, they're gonna plot against you. But how does God respond to the wicked? Well, I love verse 13. What does God do? He laughs. Does God laugh? Does God have a sense of humor? Mm hmm Yeah, God laughs. He laughs at the godless. Why? Notice the little connective there, for. Tells you why he laughs. He sees what? His day is coming. What day? The day that God comes and shows up 
It's a hot oh moment for the godless when he shows up in his glory and says it's judgment day. We could spend again the rest of the New Testament, our, our time looking through the scriptures about this day. Uh, Obadiah chapter one says this, for the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal should be upon your own head. This is Lex Talionis, eye for an eye. It's tooth for a tooth. God says, I'm gonna settle the score one day when I appear. Uh, Amos chapter five, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is that day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and he met a bear. Or as though he had went into a house, leaned on his hand on the wall, and a serpent met him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not dark, very dark and no brightness in it? Why? Well, because the luminaries will, will be turned off by God. Talk about dark. See, we could go on and give you references for the day of the Lord, but the day's coming. What does God do? He looks from his throne down the halls of time because he's outside of time and space, and he sees that what the godless are doing right, right now to create all kinds of havoc, he looks down from heaven and goes, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. You think you're gonna rule and reign over my planet that I made for my people and my son's gonna rule and reign? Uh-uh, it's not happening. Your day's coming, the day of judgment. The day of judgment. I have to ask you, are you ready for that day? There's only one way to get ready. You come to Christ and you place your faith in him. David gives us uh, some advice in verse 14 about lex stallionis, eye for an eye. He says, the wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the inflicted and the needy to slay those who are upright in conduct, but their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows will be broken. So when God comes back, it's the great reversal. All those who've taken advantage of people whatever it's been, a corrupt police officer taking advantage of people, people rioting in the streets for the, all the wrong reasons, I mean, whatever. He says when, when he comes back, he, he reverses all that, and people have to give an account for what they've done. Aren't you looking forward to that? I am. He says in verse 16, better is a little of the righteous than the abundance with the many wicked. Better to have little in this life and to follow Christ and to know God than to have tons of money. Uh, Eddie Van Halen died this week. Who's Eddie Van Halen? How do you not know? I'm from California. I, that was my group when I was younger. He was only a couple years older than me. He died this week at 65. He was worth $100 million. Have you ever studied his life? I mean, he didn't write the song Running with the Devil for no reason. Evil life. Cocaine, quaaludes, vodka when he was a teenager. You name it, he did it. You know, when he died this week, it was sad. It was a passing of a great guitarist. He was totally gifted. But I had to ask myself when I read that he died, I wonder, was Eddie ready? Was he ready? For what? To stand before God? Because he had much, but if he didn't have God, he had nothing. See, do you have much? Well, if you have much if you have Jesus. He says, verse 17, the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the, the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless. Their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil. In the times of famine, they will have abundance, but the wicked will perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like, uh, like the glory of the pastures, they will vanish. They're gonna be like smoke. And you light a match, and you see the, the flame, and God just goes, Phew. they were there, and then they're not there. And when they're gone, who's gonna be left? All those who followed Christ. And he comes to set up the kingdom of peace. I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to what's coming. In the meantime, I'm trying to live for Christ. Hopefully you are as well. It is what our culture needs. It's what our culture needs. Civil unrest is all over the place. People are buying ammo like never before, are they not? They're scared to death. They should be doing what? Praying and looking to Christ, who has all the answers. Let's pray. God, thank you for the clarity of the word. May we embrace the word, live the word, and not be ashamed of the word. And may your peace, your shalom, be all about us in these angry, tumultuous times. And might we lead many people to Christ because the fields are white to harvest. Amen.